Welcome, everybody. It's great to see you. And we are just so excited that you've joined us tonight for the basic training on the steps to freedom in Christ. Uh, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for tonight. We thank you for your son who made all this possible that we have this freedom. We just pray for your blessing on this presentation, on the presenters, on the technology, and everyone that's attending this lesson tonight. May you be blessed and glorified through this, and may we all learn more about taking people through the steps and gaining their freedom. We love you and we thank you. It's in his name I pray. Amen. 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 All right, we have two presenters tonight from the uh, West Coast, from California, from the Southwest region, as, and, as well as the Northwest region. And I'd like to ask Lori to introduce first Patty Minahan. Uh, Patty's been with uh, Freedom in Christ since 1993. She is a CFMA, and she's also, along with her husband, Terry, the Northwest Director of Expansion for Freedom in Christ Ministries USA. She was born and raised in Washington, uh, and she also uh, got two degrees there, one from Seattle Pacific University. She received her degree in education, mm -hmm. and from um, the uh, University of Washington, she received her degree in social work. So she's a teacher. She's a social worker. Her husband and Terry will celebrate this summer their blessed 50th wedding anniversary. That is just... Woohoo! It's a miracle! <laughs> awesome, Patty. Hallelujah. Congrats. Um, and again, she's married. She has three adult children who are married, and she has seven grandchildren. She's also, along with being a teacher and a social worker... She has also been, um, uh, she's, <laughs> she's actually run bridal shows at convention centers. Uh, she's been an uh, interim director of worship and arts at her church. She is also, <laughs> she tells us that she even worked for a summer in Alaska at a fish cannery <laughs> with one of her daughters to help raise money for college. After retiring, she said, just kidding. So in her <laughs> mid fifties, she became an airline attendant and she began to fly with uh, Alaska Airlines. She soon became a supervisor and she ended her flight career overseeing new hires and uh, for flight attending. She's an avid volunteer along with her husband. She has served on school boards. We have that in common, Patty. I also served for a number of years on our local school board, and she's uh, also been on the hospital board. She and her husband are often leading small groups, and it's all about freedom in Christ, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. So I think I've covered everything. The both of them, Terry and Patty, are very devoted to nurturing Christians in all levels of maturity to become fruitful disciples of Christ. So we're excited to hear from you, Patty, tonight. Thank you. Welcome, Patty. And now to Sharon Chapman. Sharon was born in Morris, Illinois, went to Washington, Yakima, Washington in 1964, attended Mary Hurst College, where she got a BA in English literature from the University of British Columbia. She went into teaching, did that for a while, then became a stay-at-home mom. Uh, she did that for a few years. They eventually moved to Escondido, California, where they've been for 45 years and 40 years in the same house. Now, that doesn't happen that often, so that's great. Uh, married to David for 50 years. They have two married children uh, and three grandchildren, one of which, who Sharon, does the uh, homeschooling. So busy, busy person. Uh, she's also... Uh, is a CFMA, obviously, an E3 director in the Southwest region. And she is also, when she has more time, director of the Living Free in Christ ministry at Emmanuel Faith Community Church, uh, where they've trained 14 encouragers and discussion group leaders. And on top of that, she's a trained lay counselor at Emmanuel Faith Community Church as well. So, and at age 42, she got to know Jesus as her Lord and Savior. So, that's great. So we welcome Patty. We welcome Sharon. And now it's turned over to you. And by the way, this is the first of two parts that uh, we will have the next one next month. So just stay tuned and just learn all you can. So ladies, 
It's all yours. Okay. Thank it's you. really nice to be here tonight. Patty and I have been thinking about this and talking about this for a while. We're hoping that our presentation will equip you and give you confidence to administer the steps to freedom, knowing that God is going to be there mm. doing it with you. So you'll do it well. Um, we have sent you several handouts, which you know about. So let's start tonight with that fill in the blank handout. First question is that I'd like us to think about is what is freedom in Christ? Freedom in Christ is a discipleship counseling ministry. The Freedom in Christ ministry is a ministry of reconciliation. There's your first fill in, by the way, to help captives find and walk in the freedom of their identity in Christ. Identity is a huge issue for people. And for Christians, it's important to know that ours is in Christ. Discipleship counseling is the process where two or more people meet together in the presence of Christ. There's your next fill in. Learn how the truth of God's word can set them free. So how the truth of God's word can set them free. And it enables them to conform to the image of God as they walk by faith in the power of the Holy Spirit. So then what is a freedom appointment? And how does it relate to discipleship counseling? Well, it's an encounter with the Lord. So that's discipleship counseling right there. And it's taking a personal spiritual inventory. So you got some fill-ins there. It's taking a personal spiritual inventory in these seven critical areas of your relationship with God. It's all about your relationship with him. And it's for the purpose of setting you free. Let's look at the who the people are in the steps appointment. Obviously, God is the first person and the most important one. Um, he's the one that the inquirer is going to be doing business with, and he's the one who's going to set them free. You're not, he will. The next person is you, the encourager. You're going to guide people through the steps to freedom. We're not counselors, we're encouragers. It's really important to understand that the encourager is aiming all the time to keep the inquirer focused on that interaction with God. That's what we want to keep them pointed at, their interaction with him. And then there's the prayer partner. You can have one or more prayer partners. Um, good if you can provide a trained prayer, prayer partner, but a lot of times the inquirer might bring someone with them who could be a prayer partner. And that's really good because that person then can hold them accountable afterwards. And then the final person is the inquirer, the person who is you know, looking to get free, looking to, to um, seek freedom. So really the, the thing that I want to talk about here concerning prayer partners, going back to them, is they're, they're going to be praying silently. That's their main job, listening to the Holy Spirit, seeking how to intercede for you and the inquirer. But they're also going to record information. And if you take a look at a couple of the handouts that we gave you, the one that's um, at the top of the sheet says, and I'll hold it up so you can see which one I'm talking about, this one says um, how I felt and believed, and then on the other side of the sheet, what God says about me. If the prayer partner has this with them during the appointment, and the inquirer says something about how they felt that you know is not true, you write it down on how I felt and believed. And then as you find time as a prayer mm -hmm. partner, you're going to look up scriptures and references that are going to prove that's not true. So um, that's a good thing to have in your presence if you're a prayer partner. The other handout we gave you is, um, what is the truth? As a prayer partner, as you're looking at the things that the inquirer said that you know are not true, you know, if, if the prayer partner says, I just, I just don't feel loved. I, I have never felt loved. Well, you've got some help here for where the scriptures are that prove that this person is loved. Um, I don't feel worthy. I, I just, I don't feel worthy. You've got some scripture here that proves that that person is worthy. So those two resources are really good for you to have in your arsenal to give to your prayer partners and train your prayer partners how to use them. Obviously, the next thing to use for filling in those truths is the blue bookmark. You should all have that. I'm sure you've all got that. So just keeping in mind, there are a lot of good ways that the prayer partner can start recording information that you will give to the, the inquirer at the end of the appointment. You know, the biggest danger that we've found in leading a steps appointment 
is thinking that you have to do it yourself, leaning on your own strength. And for people who are just learning to do appointments, they're feeling like they can't because they can't do it on their own. The good news is you don't have to. <laughs> You're going to rely on God. He's going to be there. He, he wants this person free more than you do. So we have to remember that when we're leading a steps appointment and, and just surrender ourselves to him, knowing he's going to do the work. We, we don't have to do the work. He's going to do it. So let's go back to the fill in the blank outline now. One thing that's important to recognize is the Steps to Freedom booklet is full of prayers. And the prayers that start the appointment off and then the prayers at the beginning of each step have specific requests that the inquirer prays, asking God for something very specific. So it's really good if you are aware of them and you can point those out. The Freedom Appointment begins with the Inquirer praying to ask the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. That's the very first thing they ask. And I like to stop after that prayer and say, what did you just ask God to do? And help him to look at it and figure, wow, if you asked him to do that, I'm going to be watching him do it. And you can watch him do it, too. I like to really get that, that established in the very beginning. Um, you're always going to want to start your stop, steps appointment with the prayer and the declaration on page four of the steps booklet. That prayer, that first prayer, that um, the, here, here's the part of that prayer where they're asking for that guidance. It says, I ask you, Father, to fill me with your Holy Spirit and guide me into all truth. I ask for your complete protection and guidance. Those are pretty important things for a uh, an inquirer to be asking God. So we want to point out the fact that that's what you just did. Let's look now at, in, in your outline, we're going to look at the prayers at the beginning of each step. And we're going to look at the part of that prayer where the inquirer is actually asking for something. So in that first one, in step one, counterfeit versus real, that prayer includes this, bring to my mind anything and everything that I have done knowingly or unknowingly that involves occult, cult, false religious teachings and practices. Point it out. That's what you just asked for. Now go look at that list of those things and see which ones God shows you. And Patty? Step two is deception versus truth. I invite the spirit of truth to guide me into all truth and protect me from all deception. And then that particular step is followed by the statements of truth. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes okay good patty so step three which is bitterness versus forgiveness which is usually a really important step and takes a little longer than some of the others but it starts with this please bring to my mind all the people that i need to forgive in order that i might i might do it now so very good request god bring them to my mind then we be quiet and patty's going to talk to you about that later and that one is followed by choosing the truth about your heavenly father. And that's a really powerful list as well. Step four, rebellion versus submission. The inquirer says, please show me all the ways I have been rebellious. And step five, which is pride versus humility. That what they pray is, please examine my heart and show me all the specific ways I have lived my life in pride. Step six, bondage versus freedom. Inquirer prays, please reveal to my mind all the sins of the flesh I have committed and the way of the I have grieved the Holy Spirit. And then step six has a second part, which is that um, I ask you to bring to my mind every sexual use of my body as an instrument of unrighteousness. Step seven, curses versus blessings. The inquirer asks, please reveal to my mind all the sins of my ancestors that have been passed down through family lines. And then we did want to point out, too, in the appendix, the overcoming fear, which we're going to be addressing next month. We're going to do a, a lot of work with that. What that prayer says is, I ask you to reveal any and all controlling fears in my life and the lies behind them. There is a section on overcoming anxiety as well that we'll be looking at next month that um, has some really good pointers of how to work that through. Um, you just want to reinforce with each of these prayers that you're doing this with God and this is what you've asked him. 
And we're going to be watching him to answer that prayer. And then when he does, it's so exciting at the end of a step to say, wow, look what he did. And rejoice with them about how God answered that specific prayer. That's a time of reinforcing in their lives that God really cares. And he's here and he's doing work in their life. So it's really important to do that. Um, it's going to keep their focus on God, not you. Um, as you go through the steps, they're written in a specific order, but sometimes you need to be flexible to get out of that order. Uh, for instance, I was taking a lady through the steps recently, and we did steps one and two, and then it was so clear to me that pride was just a huge issue that we jumped to the step on pride versus humility, and then we went back uh, to step three. So be flexible in, um, just let the Holy Spirit guide. Really, it's so wonderful. We don't have to be in charge. The Holy Spirit is. Okay, Sharon. I've done that too, where, you know, at first, when I first started doing this stuff, like, I need to do this in order. And then God would show me, we're going to get out of order here because it makes sense to do that. So just let him show you that when you need to. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, Freedom is going to result when they confess when they renounce lies, when they forgive, because they want to be right with God. So that's what's going to bring the freedom. Um, so you might be asking, what defines a good candidate for going through the steps to freedom? Next month, we're going to be looking at what defines a good candidate. Um, we won't go into that now, but I just want you to know that we will, and that there are a number of things we're going to look at next month. So just take a look here at what they are, what motivates an inquirer to request a freedom appointment, what defines a good candidate for the freedom appointment? How can you best prepare an inquirer for that freedom appointment? And what are the characteristics of a complex inquirer and how do we deal with them? And how to use overcoming um, anxiety and how to use overcoming fear appendix. So that's all for next month, but we wanted to just give you a preview of that. So as we get started on the actual steps during the freedom appointment, please make sure that you are in a comfortable private room with no time restraints. There's no clock ticking. Nobody has a hair appointment at, you know, two o'clock or something. We, no, no time restraints. Phones need to be turned off or silent so they're not an interruption. Um, make sure you've got a highlighter so that the inquirer can mark up their steps booklet as they go. I have them use a pencil instead of uh, an ink pen because I think sometimes they'll go back and reuse their steps booklet in a few months or maybe another year and um, they might want to change their answer so you know or their their input so I, I it, it probably doesn't matter but that's what I have people do and then of course you need to have some blank paper because they need that They'll need Kleenexes, um, the steps booklet, of course, the Bible. You as the encourager will have their uh, CPI. They will have filled out this confidential personal inventory ahead of time. And uh, you will uh, refer to that from time to time during the appointment and then give it back to them in the end because we don't keep uh, notes. It's a totally confidential a uh, private time for them, a safe environment, and uh, we they just need to know it's, it's totally confidential. So at the end, actually, I always have a shredder there, and we shred the notes if they want, or they can keep them, whatever, but um, it's kind of, it's kind of a, a freeing thing to shred those notes, or especially the forgiveness list at the end of the time together. Remember, it is perfectly acceptable for the encourager to read the bold print in the book. When I have tried to summarize it for the inquirer, I find that they're busy reading along, trying to see what maybe I've missed <laughs> in my summary. So I gave up a long time ago trying to summarize and I just read it and then they, they can see exactly where it was coming from and they can go back to it when they want. Well, in step one, counterfeit versus real, it's a reality that the world offers many forms of guidance apart from God that seemed innocent and or attractive. So this step reveals where they have sought counsel, guidance, or direction from some source other than God. 
In this step, they'll be closing doors they have inadvertently opened to the enemy, even if it was a long time ago, and even if it doesn't seem to be a current issue. This is the beginning of modeling to them, and this is in your handout, the process of confession. They'll recognize the lie. There's a lie behind every sin that they have believed. They repent, which means to change one's mind, renounce, to turn around, to take a stand against the enemy as his lies, and replace those lies with truth. In step two, the battle is for the mind. Feel free as you're going through these different steps to have the inquirers revise the words to fit their situation, or if it's the sentences just written in a way that's awkward for them, they, they, can, they can rewrite it, that's okay. And they can also add their own things to the list and that'll, hap that'll happen um, in many of the steps. They'll, they'll personalize it to fit what the Holy Spirit brings to their mind. Step two can be a long but important step. Encourage them to not let this just be an intellectual exercise, but to slow down and consider the meaning of each one of those items. There's a tendency to rush through these lists. So encourage people to slow down. A person may know the truth in their head, but how they live shows what they really believe. Behavior always reflects belief. Beliefs lead to thoughts. Thoughts lead to emotions, emotions to behavior, behavior to habits and habits to strongholds. The inquirer doesn't need to really overthink these lists. An analytical person may strain trying to remember or figure out what they need to confess, but remind them just to ask God to reveal to them the sins in that particular category and the Holy Spirit will be really faithful to do that. <clears throat> After step two, there is the page um, called Statements of Faith, Pure Scripture. Have them read that out loud. And sometimes it just feels right to after they've been through steps one and two and they've, you know, spat in the enemy's face, so to speak. It feels good to even stand up sometimes and, and read that um, as they read out loud. Watch for unnatural pauses or other signs of interference. That's a lot of words for you to put on that blank. But watch for unnatural pauses or other signs of interference as they read the statements of faith out loud. Because that interference may indicate that their life doesn't line up with that particular truth. Maybe that's a place where they have believed a lie. It's also helpful for them to use the highlighter in that step and to highlight some of the key words and promises and things that are going to stand firm in, in uh, their life. Throughout the steps, a person renounces lies and replaces them with truth. Learn how to recognize the deception and choose truth and take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 10.5. That's what we all want to do. And that's a huge part of going through the steps to freedom. On page eight in your steps booklet, a really cool little exercise to do maybe on your own sometime is to go through that list of ways you've been deceived by the world and see if you can identify which of those deceptions are attempts to meet a need for security or a need for acceptance or significance in a way that's apart from God. That's a, that's a good one for you to challenge them to do as well. But I encourage you to do that yourself. I sometimes assign that as a follow-up homework. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's a good one. Step three, bitterness versus forgiveness. Unforgiveness and bitterness can have a huge hold on people and impact a person's emotional, physical, and spiritual health in profound ways. This step is incredibly important. So as you read through step three with the inquirer, there's quite a little bit to read as you set this up. Review the bold print of what forgiveness is, 
and is not. That, those are on pages 11 and 12. Satan will certainly want to keep a person in bondage through unforgiveness and bitterness and will probably try to make the inquirer be tempted to skip certain things that they have felt or some people who have hurt them thinking they're just unable to forgive that person. But that's a lie. God doesn't tell us to do anything we can't do, and he instructs us to forgive and to trust him to deal with the offender. It's our job, our responsibility to obey what God tells us to do and to forgive. Reassure the person of confidentiality. Be patient with this step. Reassure them that you desire to stay with them as long as it takes and encourage the inquirer to trust God to deal with the offense. Be sure to give them plenty of time to write down the names that God brings to their minds after they ask him to do that. Super important and you'll wanna jot this down. Don't interrupt their time with God. You be quiet and pray. You'll likely have to prompt them to add their own name and God's to the bottom of the list. Then read through step three, highlighting the, the, the important phrases and have them forgive one person at a time. Starting with the first one on their list, usually the hardest, they'll remember each specific incident God brings to their mind. Encourage them to identify how each incident made them feel and you'll likely have to gently prompt them to say that feeling each time as, as you begin this step. Encourage them to acknowledge any consequences they've suffered. Prompt them to say, I choose to forgive, not I want to forgive, or I need to forgive. They don't would, don't say, God help me to forgive, because he, exactly. he's already helped you. Yeah, that's a big one. They need to choose to be obedient to forgive. And don't allow them to blame or excuse. Jot that one down. A lot of times they try and excuse away the offender. And I say, it doesn't even matter if the offender meant to do it or not, or if, if they even know they did it. If, if it's an issue that the Holy Spirit is bringing to your mind, you mention it. You're doing it for your freedom, not for theirs. <laughs> Uh, merciful partners want to touch the inquirer to comfort them, but do not touch the inquirer during the appointment, in particular during step three, as they can feel violated. And that's especially if they've ever been physically or sexually violated. Mm -hmm. Instead, let this be their private, thorough encounter with God. If they cry, don't try to stop that. Let them feel the pain and feel all the emotions. But if there are no emotions that seem to come out here, you might want to ask if they've ever heard the lie that negative emotions were wrong or that they were only for girls or for babies. Or perhaps they made a vow not to show emotion, which can be renounced, gently reminding them that denial is another form of deception. But don't do not imply that they're not doing it right. Abuse survivors have always believed it was their fault. They weren't good enough. They can't do anything right. If you imply that they're not doing the steps right, they'll walk up emotionally and watch the inquirer's eyes. It's important to watch for interference happening in their mind. And in the beginning, in the introduction, you have asked them if they have interference to just say it out loud because the power of the enemy is broken when you speak out loud, right? Mm -hmm. So you've already established that from the beginning and you may need to pull that out of them as you, as you notice their facial uh, changes and then just say Some, something's going on in your mind right now. What, you know, what are you thinking? And it, it's always um, powerful to see them realize that, oh, I'm listening to a lie right now. So that's and if it. we don't do that, if we just let it go, it can influence the outcome of the steps appointment because they'll keep being influenced by it. So just say, what are you thinking right now? And right. let them tell you. Right on. So when step three, um, and I've had people write down 
20 names. I had one lady who we counted them up at the end had over 300 names. So step three can take um, a long time <laughs> for some people. But when that is over, it's a really good time to go to uh, page 23 and the Who I Am in Christ, same as the book, uh, the bookmark, right? But it's a good time to go to, to uh, page 23 and, and read Who I Am in Christ. Also, the um, prayer partner will have been doing the, the, uh, the lies and the, the truth list. And really just maybe writing down um, the lie or the, uh, the negative experience. Maybe um, I've always felt so unworthy or, or I, I, I forgive so-and-so for making me feel so unworthy or so um, anxious or like a hopeless mess or whatever. And so the, in, the prayer partner can be jotting down some of those key words here. And then later it's followed up with the truth of that. Well, that's who the enemy wants you to stay centered as, but God sees me this way. And this what is truth page um, has some, some great scriptures that get you started to, um, for, the, for the right side of the page scripture truth. So those are, those are some resources that we use all the time. So after you've finished step three, it's a really good time for all of you to take a break. Get up, take a quick walk, have a snack, use the restrooms. Um, you've got, the person has gone through a tremendous amount of emotion typically by the end of step three. It's a all dreamy right. step. It's a big one, yeah. So Sharon. Yeah, so um, by this time you're well into the steps appointment and they pretty much know how it's going. So. Step three is sort of the climax. And after that, it's, it's, they really kind of get it. So when you get to step four, rebellion versus submission, um, really important that they don't feel like, oh, I'm done, which can happen after step three. Get them refocused. You've had a nice break. Um, just talk with them about how, what rebellion is all about. We know that the only time God permits us to disobey earthly leaders is when they require us to do something morally wrong that's a fill-in, or attempt to rule outside of their realm of authority. So yes, people have authority over us, but it's usually within a, um, a set of boundaries and, and it's well-defined. So people are trying to rule outside of that or trying to get you to do something that's really wrong, then you don't, you don't submit, but you do unless those are happening. It is an act of faith. That's a fill-in to trust God, to work in our lives through leaders who are something less than perfect. And they all are. They're all less than perfect. So to trust God to work in our lives is really an act of faith. Ephesians 6, 5 through 6 says, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not to win their favor or when their eyes are upon you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. So understanding that submitting to authority is not just in relationship to that authority, but it is because of our relationship with Christ that we can do that. Okay, but then if those people in position of authority are abusing their authority and breaking the laws designed to protect you, you need to seek help from a higher authority. There are civil laws in place. There are church authorities in place to seek help when those things are being abused. Um, Patty and I talked about the fact that sometimes women are being abused in a marriage and they need to seek help. But you know what? Sometimes a man is being abused in a marriage as well. So knowing that if there's abuse going on and the person in authority is outside of the realm of, of legitimate authority, there needs to be an attempt to seek help. We need to encourage people to do that. We also need to talk about the need for healthy boundaries. And that's a fill-in. Healthy boundaries with inquirers in relationships if authority is being abused. And to seek counseling. That's a fill-in here. Seek counseling if needed for support or help in learning how to set biblical boundaries. I can't tell you how many times in the the career that I've had as a lay counselor at Emmanuel Faith where people will come in and we'll talk about setting healthy boundaries and they get it. 
they have no idea how to do that. No idea whatsoever. So if somebody needs help with that, I would hope that in your ministry, you have, you got yourself lined up knowing where good counselors are, where biblical counselors are, where, you know, programs that can help them. It's not your job to provide all this, but it's really helpful if you know who you can refer them to. Okay, so then when they get down to actually confessing the, the rebellions that they have in their hearts, and you know, rebellion isn't necessarily outward, it can also be in your heart, so ask them to be looking for that as well. And they'll go through that list of areas in which they could be rebellious. Ask them to be really specific about the things that they have thought or done. For instance, don't just say, well, I confess that I've been rebellious against my spouse, and then move on. No, it's I confess that I've been rebellious against my spouse by fill in the blank. What have you done? Withholding sex, um, talking, go gossiping about my husband or my wife behind her back or his back. Yeah. Be specific. Sin is specific. It's not general. Sin is specific. So confess it and receive God's forgiveness for it. Then this is really important too. And I, I have not done this a lot in the past, but I'm doing it a lot now because it's really producing some good results. Ask them to consider what might have happened in your past that caused you to develop that attitude of rebellion against that specific figure of authority. Because a lot of times rebellion is gonna be a defense mechanism or a coping mechanism to deal with stuff from their past. And then it just gets transferred into other relationships. So ask them to think about that. Okay, so the next step, step five, pride versus humility. Um, the inquirer is gonna pray, please examine my heart and show me the specific ways that I have lived my life in pride. I love that prayer that, you know, God test me and show me how I've been, you know, what's going on in my heart and, and show me. That's what you're doing here. You're saying, I don't get it, Lord. I'm not sure how, why, where the pride is in my life. So I want you to show me. And oh my goodness, the first, when I went through the steps for the first time, I, I'm embarrassed to say I checked every single thing on the list and I did not know. I did not understand that those things were prideful. But God has shown me, and now I do know, which is really helpful. Um, just give them time to look through that list and to spend time having God show them. Uh, they probably won't recognize from you know from living in this world the world doesn't see this stuff as prideful they what they might not have seen it that way before but god will show them if, if they ask him so um after they've checked all the things that they have done have them go back and rate them rate every single one of those from one to ten so this particular item of pride do i do it a lot is it in my life a lot or is it just yeah, not very often Give it a one, give it a two, give it a three, give it a 10 if it's there a lot. Because when they're done with the steps then they can recognize these are areas of pride that I need to keep surrendering to the Lord and seeking his guidance for. So I, I like to do that and it's been really helpful. Uh, you can remind them also that negative self-image and false humility is pride because it's being consumed with yourself, isn't it? Oh, poor me, that's being consumed with yourself and that's pride. Um, encourage them to think carefully about these and not, to, and this is a fill in. It's not just an intellectual exercise. And we've said that before. It can be the whole, all, all seven steps can be an intellectual exercise if they let it be. Remind them not to let that happen. Mm -hmm. Patty, go ahead. Stop. Step we move, six. We move on to step six bondage versus freedom. We all have innate needs for acceptance, security, and significance. The world tempts us to meet those legitimate needs in illegitimate ways. The, the close relationships that we've had all contribute to our belief system. We are impacted by the way we've been raised, by the experiences we've had, our normal daily experiences, and the traumatic experiences. We've been impacted by the wounds we have suffered through hurtful and harmful experiences. And those experiences can lead us to believing lies about ourselves and about God. Believing those lies keeps us in bondage. So this step looks at fleshly sin. 
including sexual sins, but not all fleshly sins are sexual. Walking in the flesh is behaving according to your sinful human tendencies, which are out of harmony with God. So the first part of this step deals with fleshly sins. Again, we encourage the inquirer to rate those things one through 10 to indicate how much an issue that particular thing is in their lives. It's really helpful to do that one through 10 rating. The second part of this step will deal specifically with sexual sins. Behind every sin, there's an enemy lie that makes you feel like it's a good idea or you, an idea you could get away with, or who's gonna know. And so that's basing that, going back to realizing, yeah, it's a lie. Our daily experiences, as well as any traumatic experiences, lead us to form conclusions about life, about ourselves and about God. And I'll say that again, our daily experiences, as well as any traumatic experiences, lead us to form conclusions about life, ourselves, and God. Often those conclusions are not true, especially once we've been, um, once we have become a Christian and we're given a totally new identity. But if we keep believing the lies and those lies keep us in bondage, we're gonna be uh, not walking in freedom. So we try to meet our innate needs for acceptance, security, and significance. In a human way, we often meet those in illegitimate ways. On sexual sin, the second half of this step, it's a walk with God problem. If you get in step with God, then self-control and right desires will follow. You'll be able to count yourself dead to sin once you see yourself as cleansed by God from your sexual sins. You get a new start with a cleansed body, soul, and mind. If we confess our sins, scripture says, he is faithful and righteous and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Have them pray the prayer to reveal sexual sin, even if they feel it's not needed. We want them to get clean and free. Reassure the inquirer of confidentiality again at this point and assure them that you won't think less of them. There's no condemnation in those who are in, for those who are in Jesus Christ. Remind them that you want them to be free of everything. We encourage inquirer or encouragers to pray for holy amnesia, not to remember some of the details that get shared later. And, uh, and certainly we, um, we will never ever hold information against the person, right? Who's bearing their soul and revealing. So concerning holy amnesia, um, Patty and I were talking about this and I, I told her that it's embarrassing sometimes because, you know, we're, we're taking people through steps and they're revealing some pretty deep, important things. And then I pray, Lord, I, I don't need to remember this. Take it away from me, especially if it's really disturbing. Yeah. And sometimes he'll leave things for a while for me to pray for, but then eventually he does take it away. Yeah. And then I see them a year later and they expect me to remember it all. And I don't. <laughs> no, no, me either. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, then proceed with gentleness the, and re realizing that this step is hard, but you can't skip it. And you may be the only person to hear their sin in this area. Be a safe listener. Don't gawk. Don't let your facial expression, you know, look like, oh my goodness, you did that. I mean, so, I mean, be careful. Be, be controlled, please. Some may say, you're going to be here all night if we go through this and you say, well, it's for your freedom that we're doing this. This is your appointment with God. We'll be here as long as we need to be. James 5, 16 says, confess to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Remind them that their sins are already forgiven. They can accept God's forgiveness and his cleansing. And God will break the bonds, emotional, physical, and spiritual bonds that have come from sexual relationships outside of marriage. If they can't remember a name, that doesn't matter. God knows. 
be sure that you do make a clear distinction between sexual sins that they were uh, willingly participating in and those that were thrust upon them without their consent, sexual abuse. They are not guilty of sexual abuse. It was not their fault. They did not choose it and God will not hold it against them. But they still need to break those bonds with God's help to break those physical, emotional and spiritual bonds. It's important to include fantasy affairs and emotional affairs in this and uh, break ties with an old boyfriend or girlfriend. And they may need to go back to the forgiveness step during this and uh, forgive somebody who, who they didn't think of then, but now, now they have. Mm -hmm. Pornography is a huge issue for men and for women. If that's a part of uh, their life, um, ask them to commit to get rid of anything that needs to be destroyed or, or cut off. Internet, block sites, set boundaries on social media. Um, if, if they're involved in, a, in an affair, Neil has them call the person on the phone right then and break it off. Not to say, um, oh, I, I owe them, you know, I, I need to get together. I owe them that much to do this face to face. No, they don't owe them anything. They, they need to get free. So this is, um, this is a hard step for some people and others just are so excited to just get clean that it just pours out, but it's, it's essential. Don't skip it. Sharon. Yeah. So then after that step, we have a list of uh, prayers for specific issues. And there are wonderful prayers here. And some will be relevant to the particular inquirer and some will not be. But it's really important that you give them a lot of time to spend looking at these prayers to determine which ones are relevant. And they're only going to pray those that they feel are relevant. So um, it's going to help them to identify, the prayers will help them to identify, again, same thing, identify lies and replace them with truth. So I'm just going to take you through these. Um, but before I do, don't assume that you know which of these prayers are relevant to them. You probably will have a pretty good idea because of what you've heard what you've seen in their CPI and what you've heard them talking about during the day, but give them a chance to do this on their own before you say anything. Most often they're gonna discover the prayers that are right for them. And at the end, if there's something that you think maybe that should be considered, you can say, take a look again at this particular prayer and see what you think, but let's go through them now. All right, the prayer for marriage. I think anybody who's married could benefit from praying this prayer. It affirms that that marriage is a spiritual bond between a male and a female for life. And it contains a commitment to remain faithful to your spouse. Who could it benefit from that? <laughs> so I like that prayer a lot. Um, divorce. Divorce is a really important prayer for people who've suffered with divorce because usually there's guilt and shame associated with it. But this prayer it reassures them that God still loves them. He, he's not holding that against them. It gives them an opportunity to choose to forgive their ex-spouse, which they may need to do. Maybe they've already done it, but if not, this is a good time. It also lets them choose to learn from any mistakes that they have made. You know, it's never one-sided. There's always something that I've contributed to the problem. It gives them a chance to, to learn from that. And then it ends with choosing to trust God to heal them and provide for their needs. Really important when you're um, coming out of a divorce or suffering from a divorce to know that God is going to be the one to heal you and he's going to provide for your needs. So gender identity, it acknowledges the social pressure to question gender identity. And boy, young people are being pressured to do this. So this gives a chance to say, we know there's pressure for this then it recognizes that God created us male and female and that we are to maintain the distinction between the two. It gives us a chance to say that. And then that we can choose to believe and accept our biological gender identity. And then most importantly, it gives people a chance to choose to believe that they are a new creation. They have a new identity in Christ. That's your real identity. It's not determined by your sex or not sex or change sex or whatever. It's who you are in Christ. And it's a really wonderful prayer that, that reaffirms that. 
So look, let's look at abortion next. And, and I think it's important to point out that this prayer could be used by men as well as women. If a man's been involved with a woman who's had an abortion, he may very well want to pray this prayer. It acknowledges that you sinned in taking the life of your child. And then, so important, it acknowledges that you know God has forgiven you, and you accept that forgiveness. And you can forgive yourself because God has forgiven you. And by the way, he suffered on the cross because of it. So it's done. You're forgiven. It also gives you, I love this part of the prayer, it gives you a chance to commit your child to God for all eternity, knowing that you're going to see that child someday. And this is not, it's not, an, it's not done with. So I love that prayer. Suicidal tendencies, and this includes depression also. Um, any thoughts or attempts to, to commit suicide, thinking about it, it gives you a chance to acknowledge that you've done that. I've thought about it. I've tried it. And then you can renounce the lie that life is hopeless. And you can choose life in Christ with this prayer. And again, accept God's forgiveness and then forgive yourself. So much of what we do in the steps is confessing, repenting, accepting God's forgiveness and forgiving ourselves so we can be free. That's what it is. It produces freedom. Okay, uh, substance abuse. <laughs> this one is funny. Well, not funny, but I find it interesting that sometimes people will start reading this prayer and they'll say, you know, I confess that I've used, and then they'll list every substance in the list. Tell them not to do that. Say, you know what, just confess the substances that you've actually used and abused. Have them look carefully at that. And it gives them a chance to choose to cast their anxieties on Christ. We use substances because we're anxious and, and we need relief, right? Gives them a chance to say, I'm going to cast my anxiety, anxiety on Christ. And then ch choose to allow the Holy Spirit to direct and empower me not to yield anymore to this substance abuse. I'll just say here too, if they're currently um, using drugs or if they've recently used drugs, they may need to take some very serious action here. They may, to, may need to change their phone numbers so they cannot be reached by, by um, dealers. They might need to break off contact with friends who are using. Just get away from it. If it's a temptation for you, you got to break those off. Um, again, I, I will say that it's important for you as an encourager to know what the resources in your community are, know where the rehab facilities are, know where the recovery programs are, be able to refer them to professional help if it's serious enough that they can't do this on their own. What they're doing today is they're saying, God, I've done it and I'm done with it, but they may need help to follow through with that commitment. So the more help you can give them, the better. Okay, eating disorders or self-mutilation. Um, I had a group at Emmanuel Faith of young women who were self-mutilators. They were cutting, they were, I mean, they were doing vomiting, they were doing all kinds of things. And it was just so sad, but it was important for them to, re to remember that they need to renounce the lie that their value is dependent on performance or appearance. That's not how your value is, is determined. So you don't have to do these things to be valuable. But that's easy to say and hard to believe. So this, the beginning is to renounce it. This prayer also renounces, renounces trying to cleanse yourself from evil. Many times cutting, that's exactly what it is. Got to get this out. Got to get this out. So you know what? You can renounce the fact that you, you can't. That doesn't remove evil from you. Christ sacrificed on the cross and his cleansing blood has already given you that opportunity. Trusting him removes that from you. And then it gives them a chance to thank God for accepting you just the way you are with all this mess you're bringing to him. He doesn't care. He still loves you. And Christ, you are in Christ, even with all this mess you're bringing. If you've received him, you are in Christ. And that's where your hope is. So that's a really big one with young people. Um, drivenness and perfectionism. I don't think I've ever led a woman through the steps to freedom who didn't pray this prayer. It's so common to have believed the world's lie that you got to work hard to be valuable, to be appreciated. The world has convinced us that our value depends on what other people think about us. And I know men believe it too, but women are really susceptible to this. So be, be alerted to that. 
It's going to renounce the lie that your worth is dependent on your ability to perform. Bottom line, that's not, that doesn't make you valuable. Then it recognizes that you're already accepted in Christ. It's, it's a done deal. You're, you're accepted. You're valuable. You're, I love um, Deuteronomy 7, 6, I think it is, that God chose us out of all the people in the world to be his treasured possession. That's who you are. You're already, you're not just valuable. You are a treasured possession. So I like to bring that one in there. Gambling is new. That hasn't been uh, with us for too many years, but apparently it's a bigger problem in getting to be worse. So it gives the person uh, a chance to admit that they're chasing a false God for the love of money, or sometimes just for the rush of adrenaline that happens from gambling. That's, you were chasing a false God there. And then it asks God to show you the way of escape when you're tempted because he's promised that he would. There is a way of escape. I'm asking him to show you what it is. Again, you might need to refer them to some kind of a, a recovery program for this one. Counseling or rehab. Big deal for follow-up sometimes. Okay, the final one is bigotry. It admits that judging others by external appearances or behaviors is wrong. It's just wrong. It asks God to show you the root of your bigotry because you got it somewhere in your life. You picked it up somewhere. Ask God to show you where it is. And then it makes a pledge to God that you're going to walk in a manner worthy of his calling. He called you to live in Christ and live for Christ. And it just says, I, you know what? I want to do that. So I like that prayer a lot. Okay, so those are all those extra additional prayers. And I know it's late in the day. You've been sitting here all day long, but don't skip this one. Let them take as much time as they need to look through this. And when it's over, they might need a, they might need a quick break before you finish up, but whatever it takes. Um, okay, step seven, curses versus blessings. The iniquities of one generation can adversely affect future generations unless those sins are renounced and their new spiritual heritage in Christ is claimed. And uh, the first time we saw this, we, we miswrote it and said the bus stops here. We know that's not the saying. We know it's the buck stops here. But Patty, why did we change it and keep the bus stops here? Oh, well, to get off the bus <laughs> and choose that the buck stops here. Right. Yeah. It's like, this is your chance to say, this has been going on in my family for generations, but that's it. I'm done. I'm done with it. As so, for me and my influence on other people, I will never pass this along again with the help of the Lord Jesus Christ as my new identity. So a lot of times, um, well, let me, let me just go here. Um, assure them that they're not responsible, that's a fill-in, for the sins of their ancestors. We're not saying you're responsible for your ancestors' sins, but we know that they most likely have been influenced by them. You can't not be influenced by your, the world in which you grow up. So we know they have been. In the prayer uh, to begin this step, they're going to ask God to show them all the sins of their ancestors that have been passed down through family lines. Okay, a lot of them will just seem so comfortable for them or so natural for them that they're not even going to recognize them for what they are, which is why we gave you the last handout. It's called Sinful or Destructive Family Patterns. And it's a great big long list. Oh, here, I'm over here now. It's a great big long list of things. And I like to not give it to them immediately. I like to let them pray and ask God to show them things. And then if they're just not coming up with it, I might say, okay, take a look at this Sinful or Destructive Family Patterns list and just see if any of those things have been in your family. And usually they'll find a lot. They will find things that are really common in their, in their parents, their siblings, their cousins, their grandparents. They'll see patterns. So it's just a simple prayer now. I've identified the things, that the, the ungodly um, ways of thinking, the ungodly ways of behaving that are common in my background. And I'm just going to renounce them one by one. Lord, I renounce you know, just pick them. Lord, I renounce critical spirit. Lord, I renounce jealousy. Lord, I renounce cursing. Just go through the list. And renouncing means I'm not, I'm not going to do it anymore. 
it's very powerful. So just let them do that. Once they've gone through that, um, let's just let them renounce it. We've been talking about things that you're writing down during the, the session and you're, you're probably taking notes. I do, because if something comes up in one step, we don't deal with it, but I know it's going to come up and it should come up in another step. I'll jot a note to remind me that, well, this, is, this needs to come up in step six or seven, just so I remember. And the prayer partner is taking down a whole bunch of information with the lies that are being believed and writing on the scripture that contradicts those lies. Um, Patty mentioned shredding things at the ends of a steps appointment. Any notes that you've taken that don't deal with the lies that they believed and the truths that they need to know, which I don't have the privilege of having a shredder because the church puts me in a different room every time. So I don't have a shredder, but I say, I'm not keeping any of this. I'm giving it to you and you can shred it. You can tear it. You can do whatever you want with it, but I want you to know I'm keeping no record of this. Yeah. At which time I also hand back the CPI. I'm not keeping you. I'm not keeping. We don't keep records of anything that happened in here. And at that point, I like to reassure them, we're not going to be talking about this. We're not being sharing any of this. It's it's this has all been for your freedom. So um, yeah, that's just important. Anything else, Patty, that you're thinking about? Well, as we conclude think about this question. What is often the missing ingredient for a Christian between salvation and maturity? Freedom. Mm -hmm. Freedom is often that missing ingredient. Mm -hmm. So the steps to freedom are primarily a tool which enables you to minister discipleship counseling to inquirers so that they can come to know the presence of God and find resolution for the conflicts that are keeping them from walking in freedom. Inquirers need to be actively involved in their aftercare, and they must be in prayer. They must be in God's word and in fellowship. There are so many resources available to them, like the online Freedom in Christ devotionals, books galore, small group courses, and the steps booklet itself. The tools they acquire going through the seven steps are useful for creating and maintaining a pattern of God-honoring daily lifestyle a life lived in harmony with the Lord. The steps booklets in the back have quite a few useful prayers that are really great for them to use, especially in the beginning as they work toward maintaining their freedom. It's essential for inquirers to understand that they have a responsibility for continuing to surrender their lives to God and choosing to live according to his truth. All right, we are ready for some Q and A. Okay, well, thank you very much, Patty and Sharon. We are ready for some Q&A. We've got a few questions, so Lori, why don't you just lead us off? Okay. Um, so I think most of us now in the, the age and days of COVID, um, many of us, our churches have been closed, so there are a good number of us that have, in fact, led online courses. Mm -hmm. uh, we received a question about what percentage of people in your experience that go through the Freedom in Christ course actually go through the steps to freedom? How do you handle that? Because obviously, you know, I will often tell them that, you know, going through the course, they have received a, a lottery ticket for free and it's a winning lottery ticket. And are they going to cash it in or not? But how do you handle that, Patty and, and Sharon? I have only done a couple of, of uh, steps appointments on Zoom. I have continued to do them in person and just been safely spaced in a room. When we take people, and my husband and I um, do the small group discipleship course, and uh, frequently we're one after another session we run on these and between uh lesson seven and eight that's when they recommend you take the group through the steps so we have done that uh, uh, when COVID first hit we didn't and oh it was much less effective than um with the the subsequent groups after that we just went ahead and did it but we had people spaced and so they would come together for the introduction of each step and then go off to a private space um, to, to deal with the step. And then we had a 
bell we rang if they weren't back in the room, you know, before it was time to go on with the next. People could mask up, they could do whatever was comfortable for them, and we were spaced. So um, at the end of that, then if people wanted a one on one appointment, then they asked for it. So that's how we dealt with it, Sharon. So um, in terms of the percentage of people from a class who would go through a steps appointment, um, I have discovered that the more you prepare them to know what the steps are as you're going through the class, a higher percentage will actually take opportunity to go through the steps. So around, <coughs> around step, or if, we, if you're doing the um, Freedom in Christ course, around week five, we introduce the steps briefly and we actually show them those prayers that each step has so they know what you're going to be looking at. And then we talk a little bit more about it as we go along. And by the time we're, we're at um, the seventh session, which is preceding the group steps, we've pretty much given them a good idea of what the steps are all about. So we've had pretty good turnout for the um, group steps. Yeah, we I'd say, to... well, the last one we did, we had 100%, but yeah. before that, 60, 70, 80% sometimes. But when we do a, a longer class, like the, if we do the, we call it the Truce to Transform class, but that would be Victory Over the Darkness for 10 weeks and then Bondage Break for 10 weeks, doing the steps at the end of that, um, there's a lot of time in a long class to talk about what the steps are and what they can do. Mm -hmm. And we had previously always offered just private appointments and we didn't get as high a percentage with that. We'd get maybe 20 to 40% of people in the class doing private appointments. So then we discovered that if you offer the group appointment, and then from the group appointment, if there are people who didn't feel they resolved everything, they could do a private appointment. That was a nice combination way to do it. So there are a lot of ways, but I think the key is to make sure as you're going along through a course that they really get an idea of what the steps are gonna do, what it's gonna be all about. They're much more likely to do it than if you just say, well, you know, it's good, you should do it. Yeah, and we advertise it. Um, <laughs> we put it on the schedule from the very beginning if you sign up to do this course part of the course is um, on a weekend retreat we call it a day away and it um, will say the group will decide whether this will be done on a saturday or a sunday afternoon mm -hmm. so um and then you know that is a group decision but they yeah. they commit from the very beginning to have a day where we go through <clears> the steps so then they're looking they forward it. to it too. The mm -hmm. other thing, talking about Zoom, um, Patty's been teaching on Zoom and or not, and and I've I've actually been teaching on Zoom too. But uh, Kata and Gary Davidson, who are our newest CFMAs at Emmanuel Faith, they did the um, Freedom in Christ course on Zoom recently and did the steps on Zoom also group steps. Everybody, no, two people. Eight out of ten people participated in the group steps mm -hmm. on Zoom. And what they did is they do the pre present each step and then everybody would mute and take themselves off the video and do the step along with the Lord and then come back and mm -hmm. it worked really well. So mm -hmm. we need to be open to what God shows us to do yeah. and to be ready to do something different than what we've done before. We too have done uh, a number of classes via Zoom and the group steps via Zoom. Okay. We've had almost 100% participation yeah. but if someone has in, indicated that they've had difficulty they contact us and then we will uh, set up an individual appointment for them there is a question is it advisable do you ever advise uh, someone to take an individual of the opposite sex through the oh, steps God. never good question no it's not a good idea no Never. Yeah, here's interestingly, um, when, well, let's see, when Ron and Carol Wormser, sometimes as a couple, they would take someone through, but Ron would never take a woman through. Um, it, it would be a rare situation where a couple would take a woman or a man through. I think that'd just be really rare. 
I, but I have never always, just one, never a woman with a man or a man. No, or a woman. never. never. And you can imagine when you get to the sexual sins, it's just not going to be comfortable. No, no. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, someone has a question about the recommended break after step three. You know, what do you basically offer to folks, you know, um, it's to remove, uh, uh, obviously we start the, the freedom appointment and with indicating that we're trying to remove all kinds of distractions. Um, so do you ever instruct people not to check their phones or email, et cetera? Because they're, they're just curious to see yeah, yeah. what happens in that break yeah. time. I usually say, let's have a little something to eat or, you know, go to the restroom. It's, but. it's basically best practices. What have you folks seen that works the best? Well, Patty, I know you've said that you ask them to turn their phones off when they come in. And we do, too. And, you know, I, we, we, we inform ahead of time that this is a day that you're going to be with the Lord as long as it takes and we don't want you bringing any other influence in. So get it all settled before you come and leave it out. Leave it out of here. Another thing is that as we have talked before the appointment, you know, when we're choosing the day and, and helping them um, be, have their schedule be free, I'll say um, it, it, in my experience over the years, a typical appointment for a woman uh, goes about five hours. That mm -hmm. is just pretty pretty standard. Um, sometimes it's less, and I've had some go over 10 hours. Mm -hmm. So it depends on, um, oh, the, just the different issues they've allowed in their lives, the controlling things, the spiritual forces that they accepted as legitimate that are, you know, from the enemy. And um, so there just has to be flexibility in that time. And if they know that from the beginning, maybe oh, yeah. they'd be less tempted to check messages. Yeah. However, I know one gal was meeting and she said, my mom is really, really ill. I'm going to have to check my messages every now and then. And I said, of course. And that- Grace, helped. we have to yeah. have grace, yeah. Yeah, and that allowed her to actually concentrate more on the steps when we were doing that because she felt right. at ease knowing her mom was okay. So mm -hmm. those kinds okay. of things. It's really important for us to make it make it real clear that we're giving our entire day and we want them to do that too. And we don't know how long it's gonna take, but you know, I've had people who say, well, I've got to pick my kids up at two o'clock or you know, I, I got a doctor's appointment at 10 and I can't come until 12. And you know what? You just pick another day then. You don't let that be a determining factor in how long you stay. You stay as long as God keeps you there. Excellent. Thank you very much. How do you handle the freedom appointment with someone that you know personally and may be familiar with their family and friend issues? I would handle it the same way I handle any other freedom appointment. It's confidential and everybody's got to know that. Um, the only reason I wouldn't take someone like that through is if I felt they weren't going to be honest because we're friends. Mm -hmm. In that case, I might say, you know, would you prefer to be with another encourager? Would you be more comfortable with another encourager? And I have done the same. I have offered someone else who is a stranger to them yeah. and, um, and then let them choose right. which, in, which encourager. Right. Okay. Uh, another question that we have is how do you handle family history and personal history? And it, I mean, do you send out the CPIs in advance? Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. So if you have a group of 30, you would send out. Oh, you know what? I do that with a one-on-one. -on -one. I don't do that for group. I don't have them fill out the CPI if we're doing it as a group. But if they, um, because you... <clears throat> you are not involved with them one-on-one -on -one during the step as a group. They go off on their own to do it and come back for the introduction of the next step. Um, but if they request a personal appointment, then I have them fill out the CPI. Okay. Sharon? Uh, I, we, we actually have them fill out the CPI for the group appointment, but we don't see it. Okay. Because I think the CPI has two important um, benefits. One is, 
for our benefit to be able to know information to help guide them, which is important if it's one-on-one, -on -one, not important in a group. But the other benefit is to prepare them for the steps. And, and I've found that when they go through the group steps, if they do the CPI, they're better prepared for it. Thank you well, for that tip. And one thing that I do, uh, even with the uh, group appointment, I think receiving a statement of understanding from everyone that's going through the, the steps, I think is important. Yes. That is the one piece of paper that I do want to have. I don't know how you feel about that, but um, some C CFMAs aren't even aware that that's one thing that we need to do. So that I think that's an important. Yeah. Emmanuel Faith requires it. Emmanuel Faith won't let us do it without. I mean, it's a legal document basically and it's right. for protection, right. so it's important. Okay. so share with us what information actually should a prayer partner be recording? How do you prepare your prayer partners? Well, they obviously are gonna be recording any lies that the inquirer has believed. And that will be mostly in step three when you know that thing that happened to me made me feel useless or helpless or worthless. They're gonna record those lies. And then they're going to record the scripture and the truths from scripture that contradict those lies. That's the most important thing they record. They don't need to be keeping a lot of notes. But if they're new prayer partners, sometimes they're recording notes for themselves to help them learn to be better prayer partners. And if that happens, I make sure that that's shown to the um, inquirer before they leave. So they know we're not keeping anything about them. Right. Good point. I think that sometimes the inquirer will be telling a story during one of the steps that refers to another step. So it needs to, for instance, they might be talking about family things during the, the introduction the, and the, or the first step as they talk about influences, um, counterfeit and whatever. So some of those things might need to get repeated or, or brought up again in step seven when they are renouncing um, things that they don't want that came down through their family line that they don't wanna continue on. Or out of a story will come something that you know, maybe it's, it's um, habitual lying um, and that comes out in the bondage of step six. And so some, some different things like that, that especially if they've been a prayer partner quite a few times, they'll know, oh, it's, this will come back up again in a few steps. And then if, if the encourager doesn't remember it at the, you know, at the <laughs> next step or the inquirer, overlooks mentioning it, then the prayer partner can just say, well, you did mention this earlier. And then that's a good catch. Something else they could record is, um, for instance, if you, maybe on the statements of faith, if after that's read, the um, encouragers suggest that it might be a good idea to read those statements, you know, every day for a month. Mm -hmm. That would be like an assignment, maybe. The mm -hmm. prayer partner could record that so that she could hand that to the inquirer at the end to remind her to do that. That's something else she could do or he could do. Okay, uh, Sharon, you've already mentioned that you do have everyone fill out the CPI in advance to the steps group, group steps appointment along with the statement of understanding. Uh, do you have them buy their own steps booklets or do you provide that for them? Manual Faith provides them, but what do you guys do? Oh, that's neat. Well, Terry and I buy them. If it's a one-on-one -on -one appointment, we just provide it. We, we haven't um, asked people to you know, pay for the booklet, but if they're in our small group study, um, we, whatever we get charged for the um, participant book, and the steps booklet, we'll just give them that as a fee to be in the course in the class. And then we say, we always say, but we do have a scholarship fund for anyone for whom that would be a difficult thing. Mm -hmm. And um, for instance, the last class we had uh, 
12 people, only one person paid, <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Typically everybody does for us. So wait. Very good. Do you ever recommend doing the steps to freedom, especially when you have a large group over a couple different days versus having a day away retreat? I think you lose people one or the other day. Um, and I know that it was, it, Neil is really big on, a surgeon wouldn't open you up and do half the surgery and say, oh, come on back, you know, tomorrow or whatever. They, he, he'd see it through and stitch you up and send you home with a, a really uh, good uh, risk of recovery. It's really rare, really rare that I would uh, spread a steps appointment over two days. I did that in the case of a gal recently who we went nine hours doing steps one, two, and five. And she was just exhausted. And she said, I can't, I can't do anymore. I, I really want to keep going, but I can't do anymore. And um, so in her case, uh, we came back and finished later. But Typically, that's unusual. Typically, for I, it's all in one shot. How about you, Sharon? I same thing. I, you don't want to open things up and then send them home. You want to stay there and stay with it. And th there's a momentum that occurs as you build on these steps. So you know, being able to finish it in one sitting is really good. But like Patty, I have on occasion. Um, I had a young lady who was a victim of satanic ritual abuse, and we, we met three times, three days. But that's really rare. That yeah. just doesn't happen very often. Yeah. What should I do if the inquirer is just reading the prayers intellectually, is, does not seem engaged at a heart level? You've talked about a little bit during your presentation. I think I would just say, let's slow down. And let's talk about what's happening here. Um, you know, you, you're, you're interacting with God, so it's okay to be honest. It's okay to be open. Uh, there's no right and wrong way to do this. I mean, I think I would give them permission to just do it differently. Yeah, yeah. I've encouraged people to slow down too, or I've said, let's just take a couple of minutes and just review this list again. You don't have to read it out loud, you know, but just take another look at it and then we'll mm -hmm. move forward. And, and we have to trust the Holy Spirit the whole time through mm -hmm. this. We're saying, Holy Spirit, you're in charge. I'm not, Jaren's not, you're not. Mm -hmm. um, so the Holy Spirit and the inquirer are doing the hard work. And if I, I just have to trust that the Holy Spirit will bring that person back to deal with whatever he or she skipped over, you know. And, you know, the, the onion peel idea. Yeah. Some people are not ready to do it at a deep level right now, but whatever level they do this at, that's where they are. And that's where God is meeting them. So. Uh, when I first started doing steps appointments, I'd walk away disappointed because it didn't do what I thought it should do. And then God sort of, you know, got a hold of me and said, Sharon, I'm doing what I'm doing. and <laughs> Just uh -huh. accept it. <laughs> Onion peel is a good, good reminder. Thank yeah. you. And this will be part two. And as um, they met, uh, Patty and Sharon mentioned, some of the things that will be covered is what motivates an inquirer to request a freedom appointment, what defines a good candidate for a freedom appointment, how can you best prepare an inquirer for a freedom appointment, we've talked about that a little bit, what are the characteristics of a complex inquirer, uh, we're going to actually bring in some speakers at the beginning of the, our next training year to talk to us about um, interacting with a complex inquirer, how to use the overcoming anxiety uh, appendix and how to use the overcoming fear appendix. So you'll want to be sure to mark your calendars for June 16th, I believe it is. Correct. Yes, June 16th, uh, right here. Uh, you'll be receiving the promos in your uh, <laughs> inbox weekly. So be looking for them. If you do not get them in your inbox, be sure to check your spam folder because 
we send these out en masse and they often do get uh, end up in the spam folder. So thank you all for joining us. And we hope that you've benefited greatly. We've received great information, best practices. Thank you, Sharon, and thank you, Patty. Yes. No, thanks to both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you folks for attending tonight and let us close in prayer. So gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to learn. Uh, we thank you for what it means to set people free and the steps that's needed to be taken. We just love you and we thank you for the preparation of uh, Patty and Sharon. And, and John in the background, and just thank everyone for giving time tonight. We love you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.